Hello everyone and welcome. I am so excited. If you don't know, I'm going live every month of 2021 with a new guest. So we've talked to some amazing guests so far. We've talked to Olympic champions, world champions. We have talked to people who are literally the best at what they do. And today we're gonna to talk to two more people who are truly experts in their craft. And these people are my parents. So I'm so excited to have them on. I've got an entire list of questions you guys asked. And yeah, we're gonna pick my parents' brain. We're gonna understand kind of like what my childhood was like, what their philosophies for raising kids and how that interacted with sports was, and talk about now and kind of what we're up to now. So super excited. I'm gonna get them on and then we're gonna get started. So if you just wanna give me a second and I will get my parents on these special guests this is also gonna be the first time we ever have two guests at once so thanks everyone for tuning in too so okay we have one hi dad hi mom hi hey jenny how are you guys great great Good. so i want everyone watching to know that my parents actually do like each other they're in the same house they're just in separate rooms so we don't have interference and all that going on so they're actually in Northern Virginia right now, which is where I grew up and where I started shooting. And they're very involved in the shooting community there. So cannot wait to get this started. Uh, yeah, so if you guys are ready, I'm just gonna give a little quick synopsis of how I got started shooting and then we will jump into our questions. Okay, so like I said, my name is Jenny Thrasher. If you do not know that, welcome. And I started shooting when I was 14 years old. So. I actually can remember very vividly going to the range the very first day and my mom took me and most kids on their first day you know they get a safety briefing and they shoot off sandbags and they shoot for maybe you know an hour and then they go home and if they like it they come back and I remember vividly after three hours mom you dragging me off of the range and being like we have to go now <laughs> Um, and that kind of started a, uh, a long four years of my parents taking me to matches and practices every day, along with figure skating. Most people don't know this, but my parents, especially mom, you would get up at 4.30 in the morning to take me to figure skating practice. And then I'd go to school, then I'd go to rifle practice, and then I'd come home and do all my homework. Um, so I have fond memories of that. I don't know if you do, but... <laughs> So after shooting for four years in college, I actually got recruited to go shoot for West Virginia University. So that was about four hours from home. And I had an amazing time shooting in college, really getting a lot of resources and just, you know, kind of your first time away from home and uh, enjoying uh, new coaching and all this stuff. And I also qualified for my very first international match. So. One year after shooting my very first international match, I actually shot at the Olympic trials and kind of surprised a few people when I won. And a few months later, I went to Rio to the Olympics and I won there too. So we're gonna definitely talk about that and kind of what the Olympics are like from a parent's perspective. Then I ended up going the next three years at West Virginia University and I would go to school all day. I would compete in the winter with my NCAA team all over the country. And then in the summers, I would go travel internationally and go to all these different World Cups. Um, so yeah, that was the next three years kind of flew by after that. So I graduated in May of 2019 with my degree in biomedical engineering. And I moved halfway across the country. So now I live in Colorado Springs at the Olympic Training Center, where all I do is train and compete and kind of live the dream. So that is me. And yeah, now we're going to jump into our questions. So like I said, so excited for this one. So mom and dad, here are my questions. <laughs> <laughs> so when I first started shooting, I was 14 years old. What did you guys know about shooting? Were you guys legacies? Were you involved in this in college or what? No, definitely not. Uh, our involvement with shooting, my involvement, you, you know, maybe hunting, a little bit of plinking, uh, some in the Air Force, but nothing at all about the competitive shooting uh, sports. 
Yes, and absolutely nothing about air rifle. We did not know about air cylinders, air rifles, <laughs> how you fly with air rifles, nothing. Yeah, we're all... <laughs> we were all kind of on a learning curve those first few years, and we were we were definitely in it together. There was a, you know, you don't know what you don't know type mentality, I think. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, I was in a lot of sports as a kid. Uh, I played, oh, I did swimming, I did tennis, I did gymnastics, I did baseball, I did basketball, I did cross country, I did volleyball, I did figure skating. <laughs> so uh, why did you put my two older brothers and I in sports? Did you think that was a good thing for us? We did. I'm going to field this question. We thought it was really good to learn the team aspect and individual aspects. And it's, we moved a lot in the military, so it was a good way to make friends. And I have my four pillars of uh, ch child rearing that I tell everybody. And it's just basically develop a well-rounded child. And it is to do one musical instrument, take a foreign language, it just uh, developing different sides of the brain, um, a civic organization, so you learn how to give back, and a sport. And basically the sports are, so you can find what you like to do and hopefully have a lifelong uh, enjoyment in some type of sport. So what were the rules around the sport? Were there any specific, you know, like you have to play soccer because I played soccer? Was it like that? So I don't think it was that we were having you follow our dreams. We're trying to get you to find your passion and your dream. Uh, but there was a little bit since you were the third child, the baseball, I was at the baseball field four days a week. So putting you in t-ball was much easier for me. <laughs> Swimming was the same thing. You swam after Carl swam. So it was, um, some of it was convenience and some of it was when you said, I want to play basketball and you're very short. I went, yeah, you go for it, girl. <laughs> so I will tell one story about T-ball. The rule in T-ball, it was machine pitch. So there's a machine doing the pitching. And the coach's rule was, it was a co-ed team. Everyone had to catch at least one time. And I think I was probably six or seven. Six right or here. seven. And they loaded you up. It was your turn to catch with all of the gear and a mitt that was so heavy you couldn't even hold it. <laughs> <laughs> and you just sat back there and those balls just kept hitting you and hitting you. And it took a long time for three outs to happen. But you hung in there. You hung in there. I still have nightmares about playing <laughs> T-ball. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I know you guys probably know this, but I hated sports growing up. And I really, I can remember like begging you guys to, to let me just not play sports. Um, I always thought I was more of an academic type than an <laughs> athletic type. Um, but I, I remember vividly not being allowed to quit in the middle of the season. If I didn't want to play basketball anymore, or if I didn't want to do whatever, I didn't have to, but I couldn't leave the team in the middle of the season. I always had to wait until, you know, the summer or whenever the transition period was. And once that came, then I could go and leave and do whatever I wanted. You know, I felt like I had a lot of really good freedom in choosing which sport I wanted, even though I had to be in a sport. That is true. <laughs> yeah. Right. And that was on the commitment. You know, you committed to a team, you needed to learn that there was follow through, there was consequences. And it didn't matter if you wanted to quit. We weren't encouraging that. You committed to the team for the season. You yes. were going to finish the season. Which is kind of a life lesson thing. Yeah, exactly. And did you ever, when I was a child, when I was <laughs> under 12, did you ever think I would grow up and win an Olympic gold medal? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever think I'd compete in college? Did you ever think I'd even be on a high school team? I mean, I was unathletic. You, you know, you had to find your right sport. And I will say, as a general family, you know, we all enjoyed athletics, but we were never the best at it. But I, I think it was a matter of, you know, finding something that really fit. I'd say your brothers found lacrosse and they really loved that. And, you know, who knew, but you found shooting. Yeah. And we wanted you to follow your passion and your dreams and find who you wanted to be. We didn't want um, our children to live through us or us to live through them. Um, so we wanted you to be yourself and, um, you know, just 
find where your path leads. Did we think it was going to be at the Olympics? Probably not. <laughs> it, that wasn't our goal. Our goal was for you to grow as a person. Yeah. Well, joke's on you. I went to the Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. So speaking of that, how much does self-motivation play a role in an athlete's career, right? You know, there are definitely... I think there's a balance, right, of like the parents and the family and the coaches have to be supportive. But at the end of the day, like, they're not driving the train, the athletes driving the train. What do you guys feel about that self motivation aspect? Yeah, it's, it's a little bit, it depends on a couple of things. One is the personality of the kid involved. And, and then the other thing to realize is particularly with youth and junior athletes is you know, they don't have all of their habits fully formed. They don't, you know, they don't know all of those things. So, you know, sometimes you have to give a little boot, right? Uh, um, and, and so that, and, and that varies with the kid. You know, you might know some of your brothers may need more pushing than others. <laughs> with rifle, you didn't. With some other sports, maybe you did. So, yeah. we, you know, you kind of have to read it. And, and I would say that, you know, at some point, though, it, as the athlete gets more serious, they've got to own it. Yeah. Yeah, I concur. Yeah, I I like what you said there about like with rifle, which ended up being my passion and the sport I wanted to pursue. I never needed any motivation. You but didn't. I found rifle a little bit later in life when you're dealing with a 14 year old versus a seven year old, right? And you know, there were sports when I would drag my feet and I did not want to go to practice and I definitely didn't want to compete. And and that's how I always felt about figure skating. I never wanted to compete. I loved it. I wanted to go. But it was one of those, you know, if I woke up and I was a little tired that morning, I probably could talk myself out of going. But with shooting, it was never like that. Yeah. Me. Well, that's why I think it's important, you know, back to the to the trying multiple sports aspect. And, and you know, there's lots of studies. And you and I have both read some books, uh, you know, the range book and so forth about how it is better to let young athletes try a lot of things. And the classic case is Roger Federer, who, yeah. you know, played a bunch of stuff and played soccer. And at age 14, he was screwing around with club tennis. <laughs> and then he decided to get serious. And yeah, it was and, all him. And that's exactly, you know, kind of the, the path I had of like, okay, I'm playing all these sports. And I still, you know, did figure skating the whole four years I was in high school. So, yeah. When did you guys kind of know? as I was starting shooting, you know, my freshman and sophomore year, when did you guys know that like, oh, she could actually be good at this? Um, I, I think it was, for me, it was that summer when we went, you went to, I don't know, three or four rifle camps and your first big competitions and we're out there at Camp Perry and it was that rainstorm came through right in the middle of kneeling. <laughs> and you, I'm sure you remember that. And you, you know, you had 15 shots left after the storm and you, you know, you buckled down and that it was actually that performance where you, you know, won your first award. I'm like, you know, she's kind of good at this. <laughs> that's a, uh, that's funny that you mentioned that. Cause for me, that was not like, I remember being very excited. I remember winning. That was kind of my first national medal at that Camp Perry match. I remember being so excited. But that wasn't the moment I knew I could be good at it. So it's kind of funny to hear your perspective on that, Dad. Yeah, that's interesting. I think I just enjoyed watching you continue to grow and get better scores in high school. And every time, I just kept waiting for you to plateau. And you <laughs> would go to a match and you would get better Then you would um, increase your small bore then you would increase your air rifle and I just kept waiting for the plateau and you kept improving and you kept getting better and then I think when you started verbalizing your goals as I want to do an international competition that's my goal then I realized you were really going to take this serious yeah yeah, that's me, I really think it was the first time we flew. I was like, okay, this is getting serious. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, sorry, Dad, what did you say? And expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, both of those, serious and expensive, for sure. So how did you guys kind of react to or handle bad matches? Because even though, you know, my averages were going up and I was getting better, 
everybody has bad matches. I still have bad matches now and I call you guys. So, you know, that's, that's kind of a delicate situation. So what have you learned over the years, you know? <laughs> Because I'm sure mistakes have been made, but how do you handle that? What are kind of the keys there? I think you have to also go with the personality of the child. And I always said, you know, give a little time and space. It's like the NASCAR interview when they just had a wreck and they put a microphone in his face and said, well, what did you think? Well, I didn't think that went well, right? <laughs> and then after with some time and some perspective and some space, some good questions for parents I wrote down here. So... Uh, did you learn anything? Because that's a, it doesn't matter what your outcome was. Did you learn something? And you always said you learned something. Growth I mindset. Always, I love it, mom. Growth mindset. I always ask, is there anything you could improve on? You never once came off the range and said, that was it, I've peaked. You always came off and said there was, my kneeling needed improvement. I, I could improve this. My sights were loose and I didn't check them. I didn't look at the pellet that went crazy. Um, there was always something you said I could improve. And I think that was kind of encouragement. And the other thing I think parents can ask kids is, how do you feel about your performance? And separate that out from the outcome. Because there's many times where you say, my performance was great and those scores didn't reflect it. Or my outcome was great but my performance, you know, my MPA was off or my positions just that weren't as strong, even though I got a good score. So those are all good things that parents can talk about with their um, young athletes and their old athletes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what I like about that is you're letting the athlete drive the conversation, right? Because athletes know what they want, you know, and there's nothing worse. And I've seen it, luckily, with you guys and with my coaches. I've never had experiences like this. But I've seen it where, you know, the, the athlete's still emotionally processing and the coach or the parent comes up and they're like, you didn't do this. If you didn't do that. That's not what the athlete needs. And if, no. if they had approached that with more of a, hey, how can I help you right now? Where are you at mentality? Then you can work for that individual athlete and try to help them more. And maybe they don't know exactly when they need like a little kick in the butt or when they need some sympathy and a shoulder to cry on. But at the end of the day, you know, this isn't all about scores, right? And we're going to have defeats and losses in life, not just in shooting. So if we learn how to handle it with the proper direction from our support system when we're young, that sets us up better, I think, to handle tough things down the road as adults. Yeah, and I think there's, you know, there's a couple aspects of that. And one, and it's tough for parents, but like that moment is not the moment to be the coach. Uh, yes. It, it's hard enough, you know, to coach your own kid. And if you can all avoid it, it's better to get somebody else to coach them because honestly, kids don't listen to their parents. They listen to other people. <laughs> so there's that part. You know, right after the match is not the time to, to do that. I, I think the other part, and, you know, everybody goes through this, particularly, particularly the, I think, the junior athletes of, understanding something has happened. Maybe it was a good match. Maybe it was a bad match, but you know, this gets back to that athlete. They, the only thing they can control about that after it's all said and done is their own reaction to the match. Yeah. Sometimes there's a little bit of talking them down or, you know, letting them know that, okay, hey, that really wasn't as bad as you think it is. And, <laughs> or, you know, yes, you're mad, but if I see you slam your rifle down, that is the cat getting into your, stuff <laughs> uh, you know if i see you slamming your rifle down again we're gonna have words you know because you you know the athlete can control that reaction well and i think that's another good point about like when you're an athlete especially when you're a young athlete <laughs> <laughs> we have a another guest on our instagram live that is our cat carolina <laughs> Um, you know, when you're an athlete, especially a young athlete, and you're competing, it's an emotionally intense situation, right? It's like a pressure cooker. And even now, I've been competing for 10 years, and it can still be a very emotional thing. So I think that's a good perspective from the coaches and the parents of how do we take the emotional roller coaster down a notch, right? If an athlete's sad or angry or upset or even happy, I think 
it's the worst thing a parent can do to kind of add to that, right? Like they're upset, they didn't shoot well, and then all of a sudden someone's screaming at them. Well, now they're angry and more upset. And you know, it's just an emotional melting pot. Whereas if I'm upset, I came up like, I shot a nine on my last shot, you know, for my parents or coaches to say things like, hey, let, we'll come back, we'll think about this tomorrow, but like, let's go get some ice cream right now because really it wasn't as bad as you thought or whatever it may be can help bring the emotion level down yeah. a little bit and will help in the long run. I and think. not that the emotion's bad or wrong. I mean, no. that's normal, but, but you know, then how do you deal with it is, which is tough, especially when you're 13 or 14 or, you know. Exactly. Yeah. It's tough at 24. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, and so mom, when I was a kid, I remember this vividly, no matter what sport I did, you were always the first one to jump in. So if I was going to swim, you would be there timing. So when I started rifle shooting, what did you decide to do? So, well, first of all, I have to tell you about that first night when you went to try air rifle. Okay. And we're in this little range on paper targets that you can't, I can't see what you're doing. It, and it was me in the back, knowing nothing, watching you and thinking to myself, this is as boring as watching paint dry. <laughs> and when we left, I thought, well, that's the last time I will be going to the IWLA range. <laughs> and you looked at me before I could say anything and you said, I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So I have to say that. Now remind me what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> so when I love Oh, volunteering. Yes. yes. Did you volunteer? Did you step up anyway? Man, I did step up. I was helping with the, the high school team was just starting. That was their uh, first official year. They'd been a club team. And they were going to go to a varsity team where you could letter. And the, they had done all the paperwork. And then the girl that had put it, the lady, the mom that had put it all together, her son decided he didn't like rifle anymore. So I did. I stepped up into an administrative role. But then as you went to these camps, they would say, well, here's a class for the parents. Well, we need some volunteers at the range. You're going to be here sitting in the lobby. Might as well RSO. Yeah. So Unbelievably, I have been the West Springfield High School coach for 10 years now. Can you believe that? No, I cannot. <laughs> and I see some followers on that we uh, that I've coached and that were part of your team and part of the team afterwards. Hi, everyone. <laughs> and um, it's just been wonderful. But yes, I got involved too. And I did in every sport. I did um, cross country team dinners. I did lacrosse team dinners. And whatever the kids were in, we were there. It was every fun. field trip. Every field yeah, trip. Uh, yeah. Mom was the, the, the nurse all on the three. field trip. The nurse. <laughs> now, so as you started learning and you became a certified coach, like you said, was there ever that temptation to coach me? <laughs> yes. And I was counseled a few times by you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe that. <laughs> I know, I know. But you had great coaches along the way, and I didn't really need to coach you. And um, we could talk about what happened in the matches, and I could give you advice if I saw something like that didn't look right. Or um, sometimes I just played dumb, like, explain to me why you did that aperture. <laughs> um, that and explains a lot, actually. You could explain it back to me, which was good. But, you know, Coach Bucky and Coach Oscar, they had you. Yeah. Hey, Jenny, I think we were way less your coach and much more your sports psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can remember, I can remember staying up in high school until like two in the morning talking about shooting, you know, yeah. just, just. It kind of being a sounding board, I would say you guys were more sounding boards than yeah. coaches, right? And and that's what I wanted. And I, um, you know, I don't know if you would agree with this, but I would say in high school, I was probably a stubborn, maybe sometimes bratty teenager. <laughs> and yeah, I, I thought our communication was always very good. If I had a flashback to, to you getting your first air arrive. Your <laughs> Tell that we story. Won't. That's not a good story. We it's won't. a great story. But, but the word bratty brought it to my. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I'm sure I had some moments. Um, but you know, I, I probably can remember telling you like, no, don't coach me. I don't want you as a coach. I want you as my parent, right? And yes. and I think it's it's hard because I think all parents probably feel that temptation, especially when they have a little bit of coach training to coach their own kid. And like dad said earlier, it's just messy. It's just really not a good idea, in my not opinion. And I think it would have been harder, like, if I was a college swimmer and you were a swimmer, it would definitely be more. But I really did know nothing. So it wasn't easy. It wasn't something I was going to jump in to coach you because I didn't know myself. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I want to go back to that story. Roger, please tell us about that first air rifle. Oh, this is embarrassing. <laughs> Is, is it? Do we have permission to tell this story, Jenny? I guess we can't leave all my followers. In <laughs> okay. The so you know, and and I think maybe we'll talk more about this later. But you know, Jenny didn't. We didn't buy Jenny all of her gear right up front. First of all, we didn't know if she was going to stick with it. So you know, we have some great pictures of her shooting with no shooting pants, with an old fine work bow P seventy Junior and a, a borrowed jacket. Uh, but then, you know, at a certain point, she she was out shooting that used gun. Do you have me? Okay. You still have me, Jenny? Yep, you're back. So yeah. you said so, I was out shooting the gun. Yeah, you were out shooting the gun, and you knew it, and we knew it. And, and unbeknownst to you, we had ordered a Farmer Bow 700, as it turns out, the gun you won the Olympics with. And... Um, <laughs> We were debating on when to give it to you. Do we wait until Christmas? But that was like six weeks away. So we were trying to, we were going to give it to you and surprise you. And we had it in a closet. And I told you to go get something out of the closet. And you started with teenage attitude. <laughs> I don't want to do that. You go get it yourself. And I pull out the, probably unusual for me, the stern dad voice and put the hammer down. And then, you know, so you go in there and you start looking for whatever it was, which I don't even think we had. <laughs> and you open it up and you see this big fine work bow box and you realize we had tricked you. And <laughs> I think you are overcome with emotion about your rifle. Uh, I and remember, your behavior. And your I behavior. I remember being so angry. Like, <laughs> why? Like, why do I have to do everything in this house? Why can't they get it themselves? And then, you know, you guys were just insistent, like, just go open the closet, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I was 16 at that time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a that was one of those memorable points. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's really funny. So, leading into that, you know, how did you guys know when the right time to invest more, you know, time, energy, finances, right? This is an expensive sport, and I see a lot of parents go all in at first, and then I see a lot of parents who maybe don't or can't invest even when the athlete needs it. So how did you guys handle that with me? Yeah, for us, it was gradual. And, and I, I think like a lot of things, a little bit following the athlete's need, but also we got some good advice from people on when, you, you know, we didn't know, does she need shooting pants or not? I have no idea. Can she shoot in <laughs> or does she need shooting boots? So, you know, we got some, um, you know, we got some good advice along the way. And, and it became clear in some cases that, you know, you started out shoot your equipment and we're being held back by, oh yes, we gotta go buy the expensive pellets because, you know, it's not it's not adequate. She's at a level where she needs that. So it was very gradual along the way. All the way into your first year in college, actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think the key to that question is balance. You know, you have to balance what what money you are investing and can you use used until we see your commitment because some things were committed to some things were not uh, at the time you wanted a new pair of ice skates you wanted a uh, new flute and uh, shooting equipment and when we got down to it it was down to um you can't have it all yeah. so and sometimes you made the wrong choice sometimes you made the right choice but in the end um, balance, you know, a little bit here and there and along the way you build it up. Yeah, that's a really good point. And it's hard in the shooting community because 
you know, you may get a $500 butt play and then you may end up not liking it and it's not the right one for you. So I would say I was very fortunate to have kind of the high school and a club program that I came up in where there was equipment for me to borrow for the first year where we didn't have to go all in and just buy everything at once. Well, and we have to admit to ourselves as people in the shooting community, it's not an inexpensive sport to start. No. It's no. why, I, you know, and I was, you know, we were grateful for when you started out, there were people to loan you a gun and loan you a, you know, a, a bipod or, you know, all that stuff. So you could kind of check it out. And of course we still have that now at the range, just to, uh, Cause, and you don't want money to be the thing that stops a kid from being able to try a sport. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, so when I started shooting and up till now, you know, that's been 10 years. Do you guys enjoy watching me shoot? Well, so I know that was directed at me. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, somewhere along the line, I realized that and maybe it's a dad daughter thing, but I, I I just get very nervous and I cannot take watching you shoot. And, you know, whether it's electron, it, it was fine on paper because you can't see what the score is, but it's like, oh, it's a shot. It's a 10.8. Oh, great. Oh, no, it's now it's a 9.8. You know, oh, it's a 10.1. Oh, you know, so just this kind of constant watching shot by shot. And it's, it's really in qualifications that I can't do it. So yeah. I, now it's a, it's a kind of a common thing wherever I am, I'm, outside walking around i will tell you there are other dads out there who can't watch their kids shoot <laughs> you moms and we we commiserate we talk about the weather and then we'll peek our head in and see what the score is but uh now i can watch you shoot finals and uh no problem at all mom on the other hand she's uh she's ice in her veins yeah. every shot i want to watch every shot i want to look at it and i don't want people to talk to me it's like interrupting you in the middle of the match talk to me at the end i am watching every shot it's so funny because if, yeah, if my parents are at a match, you know, mom will be right behind me watching every shot. Dad will be in the Starbucks across the street and free to talk to you. So it's so funny. But dad, I can remember, and I didn't find this out till afterwards, but you actually tried to start watching qualifications at my very first NCAA championships. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that did not work. I, I think your first shot, it was small bore the first day, and I was going to gut through it, and you throw an eight on your first <laughs> shot. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm done. I'm out of here. <laughs> of course, you know, you came back and won the whole thing, but it was, uh, you know, it's hard on dad's nerves. <laughs> it, I, I really sympathize for the people watching because you have no control, you right. know, whereas when you're actually doing it, you know, you're, you're invested and mentally focused and you at the end have control over what you do next. Yep. Whereas watching, I mean, it's just, it's a state of helplessness, I think. <laughs> and it's, it's kind of funny for the international matches. I'll be trying to figure out the time zone so I can be up and in front of the computer and I'll ask a dad a question and say, Roger, uh, what time is this with the time change? And he goes, I don't know. I don't care. <laughs> and, and then he'll tell me, I'll say, oh, it's time for her match to start. And he'll say, I do not want to know her score. Do not <laughs> tell me a thing. And uh, so it's all, it's, even if it's, we're not at the match, I'm watching on the computer and he's so somewhere else. Yeah. I had to break her because she would start, we would be driving to WVU and maybe the match had started. She's got Megalink up and she's <laughs> out score by score out loud i'm like stop <laughs> <laughs> oh that's so funny and i think that uh, <laughs> um yeah it is it is hard to watch but my favorite part about it so for those of you guys who don't know my mom is actually a nurse and she works night shift so she's up a lot of the night and dad's up during the day so even if I'm completely across the world, there's always someone to call. So That's I can true. remember <laughs> being in Asia and calling you, Mom, and you're up, and it's four in the morning. Right. <laughs> so there's there's always someone to to talk to you between you guys. But yeah, definitely the the watching the matches is difficult. So I'm glad I don't have to watch them. I just <laughs> shoot them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so tell me, you guys and my two older brothers who we talked about earlier went to the Olympics in Rio and you got to watch me win gold there. So 
kind of what was your experience like watching the Olympics? Well, I, I'm so glad we all got to go. That was so much fun. And it was it was a great experience all around. We each had a couple of stories that we wanted to tell about our Olympic experience. And, um, you know, I lost my luggage, so it didn't get there for three days. I didn't have anything but what I took on the plane. And, and uh, Roger and I got there first and the boys came after us and Carl's suitcase didn't come either. So, and we were a long way from the airport. And I didn't know if I was ever going to get my luggage, but we did. It, it did come. And as a family, we were able to take a bus tour of Rio and see everything. So that was fun. Uh, because you were the first event, the Olympics weren't exactly organized and set up. They didn't have food. They did have beer every day. <laughs> beer. But the food trucks didn't come in until like the third day. So yeah. when you went and you were planning to eat there, Oh, that didn't happen the first couple of days. Uh, about the third day, we got to eat lunch there. Um, and uh, we did get to see a lot of the rifle sports. So we got to see pistol shooting and skeet shooting. Yeah. Um, another fun memory I have, we got to go over and see Rugby 7. That was really fun. And um, I think what surprised me most at the Olympics was how much walking. There was a lot of walking to get to you. We had to go through like three checkpoints and then a half a mile and then up and over the train station and then halfway up the mountain to get to the shooting venue <laughs> and uh, then in their checkpoint to make sure you had your tickets. So it was a lot of walking. And um, my favorite experience I was going to talk about was at the, you know, you were at the first match and you made the first finals. We couldn't figure out why we couldn't get a ticket to the finals and the air rifle match. And it was very secure. And even when we got in, we couldn't figure it out until all of the dignitaries from every country came in because it was the first medal match of the Olympics and the Olympic chairperson was there. And they were all sitting right around us and all these dignitaries. And it was such a special, special experience. It's so funny because when I was there, you know, I was kind of in the bubble and you guys did such a good job of keeping me in the bubble. So a lot of these stories, like you losing your luggage and, you know, you guys were actually, because it was the very first day, you didn't know how the crowds were going to be. So you guys were the first people in first line. First people in line. <laughs> first people in line into the shooting range hours before the event started. I remember that. Um, you know, I didn't learn a lot of these stories until afterwards. And it was so funny. Months later, you guys would say something. And I was like, what? You lost your luggage? Like, I didn't know that because I was just, you know, in my own little world. But, um, well, we yeah, did, I, sorry. You know, for you, you had your thing. And so we were trying to not bother you with, you know, you're not the Rio tour guide. So we're not, <laughs> you know, asking you any of that stuff. But, you know, there were some interesting logistical things because the shooting venue was way far away from the beaches everything you saw on tv you know that was that was a good 30 40 kilometers away and there were no hotels in the area so we ended up believe it or not doing airbnb and renting a house in a brazilian neighborhood which was very brazilian like everyone assumed we were brazilian and spoke portuguese uh we took we took uber everywhere and it was nice because I mean, a taxi wouldn't work because we didn't know how to tell them where to go. But <laughs> you could put it right there. And the, the first night we get there, and again, we don't know, honestly, there are some parts of Rio that are not places you want to walk. Uh, parts we were, of every city, right? Parts of every city, but, yeah. but they, you know, they had warned everyone, okay, don't go here, don't go there. But you don't know what the neighborhood's like. So we actually went out and walked to try to find a, a place to eat. And all of a sudden, there's all these people on the street. And we're like, what's going on and all of a sudden we hear music and and then a, like a, a tractor trailer comes with a band on it next thing you know the olympic torch comes by i and, didn't know this i yeah, know <laughs> this was the olympic procession and there's you know there's thousands of people dancing around the torch uh and it, as it goes right by where our house was and so that was like wow. our first you know, our first three hours at Rio, we got to see the Olympic torch go by.
All right. I remember from the Airbnb was my, you know, 20 something year old brothers having to sleep on princess bunk beds. <laughs> <That is laughs> <That's true. laughs> I remember getting a photo of these pink princess bunk beds and that's what they were sleeping. They were more than happy to sacrifice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, mom talked about the food and, and so forth, but yeah, they weren't ready for the food. And, yeah. and um, but they did have beer from day one. And then kind of on one of the last days of, of the competition, um, we'd, you know, we bought a couple beer and they would give away these, these plastic cups and they had all of them. So we wanted shooting cups. So we went to them and said, Hey, we want shooting cups. And it's said, Can we just, can we have some, can we buy them? I said, well, yes, but you have to buy the beer. So <laughs> and we each one of them, so we have a picture, we'll probably need to show it to you, but Rory and Carl and I have like six cups of beer <laughs> logo, trying to drink it down so we could get our student cup. What a noble sacrifice. We, you know, I'm gonna sacrifice. sacrifice. I, wanted, I wanted Roger to tell you the story about going to the Olympic Village, because I don't think you know this one either. Okay, so, enlighten me. Well, so you had tried to get us a tour and it didn't get approved and then you want to and i think you told us like the night before yeah hey, come, you know so it was it was planes trains and automobiles to get. <laughs> it was an uber to a subway to a bus <laughs> to a taxi that finally got us there and i think we left i don't know four or five hours early oh. to make sure we were there on time and it took I us all that time to get there I knew it had taken you guys a few hours. I thought it was two, not four. But <laughs> And then we had a transfer. We got off the bus, and the wind's blowing, and the sand's blowing, and we can't even see where we're going. And, of course, we don't know the language. And we walked in and saw you, and you said, any trouble getting here? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you guys are good. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, so for those of you guys who don't know, you can get passes to bring visitors into the Olympic Village. And these passes are really hard to come by because they use a lot of these passes on dignitaries and, you know, different celebrities, but also on people that, you know, like extra PTs or chiropractors that, you know, because there's just not enough space in the Olympic Village. So it's very rare to get a pass to bring like a friend or a family member in. So the day before I shot a mayor rifle event, I actually applied for four passes for my parents and my brothers. And you know, people kept telling me like, you may get two, you're probably going to get one. And if you get one, you know, you're gonna have to choose who your favorite is. <laughs> it's like, Oh, I'm not ready to choose. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I didn't hear anything. I didn't hear anything. And then all of a sudden, the day I won, a few hours after I won, magically, all four of my passes got approved. <laughs> and I got to bring my whole family into the Olympic Village the next day, which for me was very fun. Um, because the day before, the day I won, I really didn't get to see them much at all. Because I was very busy on a media tour and on the podium and competing. But anyway... So I got to bring them in, give them a tour, show them my room. And they at the village had a free McDonald's. So I went to the McDonald's and I said, you know, I want five French fries and five ice cream cones and, you know, five of everything. Then I'm trying to carry all of these, all of this food. And it's very hot, right? The Summer Olympics. So the ice cream's melting and I have five of them. <laughs> so I can remember that. Uh, but yeah, that that was a, a really special was memory. A good day. It was a good yeah, day. Yeah, it was a good day. Minus the, you know, the seven hours you spent in transit. <laughs> well, we got smarter on the way back. We just took a taxi the whole way. <laughs> yeah, some things are worth the money. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Anything else about your Olympic experience you want to share? Do we have time for more questions? I think we have time for more yeah. questions. Questions. Okay. Yeah. All right, so um, we're going to go back a little bit to talk about like the parent athlete relationship. So what advice, if any, do you have for parents of young athletes? Yeah, I think, you know, this is one I th probably with any event that you're doing with your kids, it's, 
It's make it fun. Uh, you know, we talked already about the sports. Try a bunch of different things. Um, you know, probably true with all sports, but very few people are going to go pro. And even if you do yeah. go pro, it's not for forever. So a lot of this is more about the life lessons yeah. than anything else. And then I think the last thing I would say for parents of young athletes is, you, you know, these things don't happen by accident, uh, whether it's Little League or Boy Scouts or the shooting team. You know, somebody makes it happen. And, we, you know, you were very fortunate and we were very fortunate that – when you showed up at that range, which had been started, you know, 10 years earlier in a tractor shed by, you know, Bucky and Oscar, and, and they didn't know what they were doing. They did it for their kids. And by the time you showed up, they were there for you. And they, you know, they helped you along. They helped the other athletes along. And, and I think that, so that led to us realizing that, hey, this doesn't happen by accident. We need to give back to the sport. This was the Isaac Walton League of America, which was your you know, your home range. So, you know, mom's for 10 years has been given back. As you know, I got roped into managing a new brand new 26 lane air range with electronic targets for five years. And, and uh, it, it feels really good. I think that, you know, as a, even though your kid may not be there, it, it's, you still have to give back. Well, and I think any kid is looking to their parents and they're not looking to their parents words right they're looking to their parents actions and yeah. when i see you guys give back that encourages me to give back right and it encourages me to think about you know my legacy and my career and how i can make a difference in the shooting sports and you know that's kind of one of the reasons i'm so committed to this social media grind that i'm on that hopefully everyone listening enjoys um <laughs> But yeah, I, I really think that's good advice of like having kind of a, a bigger picture, right? Like, you know, your kids being an athlete isn't about you living vicariously through them, right? It's about community and it's about learning life lessons and it's about giving back and et cetera. And the other thing is, you want to encourage your kid to find their passion. What do they love? They might not be an Olympian. They might not be the first place swimmer. They might not be um, the next grand champion. But what do they love to do? If they just like going out there and playing doubles tennis, or they just like getting in the water and swimming, that your job is to support that. If they find something they like, then you can support them in that that's the place to be. Yeah, and I think the trifecta of, you know, something you're really passionate about, something that makes you money, or let's say you have the money or support for, and something that you're good at, right? That trifecta is so rare. I, yeah. I feel like we're always thinking about like, how can we find that one thing when really, most people in life have three things, right? They have something to make them money, they have something they're passionate about, and they have things they're good at, you know? Right. And, and even if you get one of them that overlaps, that's, I mean, that's like winning the lottery. So <laughs> I think, you know, not expecting for them to be really good at something and love it, right? Like if they right. love it, that's enough, right? Yeah. And if they're really good at it and they don't love it, that's okay. They don't have to do it just because they're good at it. Well, and you see the other value that people get, at, say, out of the shooting sports with particularly even young athletes. And, okay, some of them go on to college careers, but most of them don't. And it's something that, you know, they have a, they have a team, they have team traditions, they have fun, they compete. You know, all those things are really, really good. I'll tell you the one thing that really made me feel good this last year in COVID, you, you know, so many people, everything got shut down, right? And eventually we were able to reopen the range and do every other lane, all the safety stuff. And so I was glad to do that. But what I didn't realize until a couple of months later, when you start to get athletes and parents come up to you uh, and say, oh my goodness, we would not have survived this year if Jimmy or Johnny or Susie could not have gone to the range to, you know, to see people, to do the thing that they love, to, yeah. to shoot. And, and then you realize, okay, well, that makes all the, you know, whatever pain and hard work <laughs> while. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good realization, right? Like so many people around the world are in this community. And I feel like we get really fixated on, you know, oh, I'm not good enough, you know, or I haven't done enough, or I'm not where I want to be yet. Or even for me, sometimes I'm like, 
there's not enough people in the shooting sports. We need more people, you know, and truly we need to nurture the people we have here and also, who, yeah, yeah <laughs> who, who really get a lot out of it. That's, that's a really good point. So, and do you guys have any advice for the athletes? So, you know, a lot of athletes don't know maybe how to talk to their parents. Maybe their parents are really supportive, but they don't always know what to say, right? Parents are human. They make mistakes or, you know, maybe their parents don't quite understand or they're not the most supportive of shooting. You know, how can an athlete kind of help that interaction? So I think the, the best thing, piece of advice for the athlete is to keep the communication lines open. Yeah. You know, some of them, it's very hard for them to come and talk to the coach and, and I'll get the parents kind of telling me what the kid's thinking or wanting and I'll just say, I need to hear it from them. But just keeping that communication open, mom, I didn't like when you did this after the match. I didn't like when you said I was going to get soup instead of steak when I lost. <laughs> and um, mom, it's better if you do this. You got to guide the par parents don't know either. So yeah. I think the communication from the athlete is the most important. And if they can talk to their coach and their parents and learn those communication skills, it, that again is a lifelong lesson because you're going to take that into a job and talk to a boss and be able to communicate. And uh, that is so valuable. And for the parents, if your child communicates anything to you, record <laughs> that behavior. Go yeah. with it. <laughs> yeah. E even if sometimes it's, you know, not what you want to hear, you have to reward the communication. And I mean, I, I can remember as recently as college, you know, going up to you and saying you guys like, hey, I don't appreciate when you say this to me after a match. And I can just remember that was the last time you guys ever said anything like that, right? Like you guys were so receptive, even though I'm sure it probably hurt to hear that in the moment. That's not the worst thing we ever heard you say. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the one thing I will say for, you know, for junior shooters, and again, this, this ends up being also the teenage years, but you said it. You know, parents are just human. No, yeah. You don't get a freaking manual on how to raise kids. And, you know, it's hard. And everybody, uh, particularly if there's more than one kid, it's divide and conquer. It's people are trying to do their jobs and figure out how to deal with their kids who are teenagers and talk, trying to figure out life. And, you know, so there can be a lot of kind of, it's normal, but it's also stressful. And, you know, maybe a little bit give your parents a break because, Chances are they really love you and they're just trying to do the best they can. Yeah. <laughs> you will find that out when you have kids of your own, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good point. I think it took me a long time to realize uh, about my first few coaches and about you guys that they're human. Like, you know, it was tough realizing like before I was born, you guys had a life. Like you guys <laughs> did things and you know, but also, you know, parents make mistakes, things like that. So that's a good point. And I also think we can look at the other side of the coin. I think it's really easy for parents, especially not just in shooting, but in anything that they've done before. So if your parent swam in high school and then you're swimming in high school, you know, I think it's really easy for the parents to kind of almost Monday morning quarterback. And I think for, you know, it's, it's sometimes good to remind the parents like, hey, what I'm doing is really, really difficult. And I'm genuinely giving my best effort. And today it didn't work out, you know, like you don't get to roast me for that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And even I've heard so many stories of parents who have said to me, I didn't understand until I tried shooting until I shot so-and-so's gun. I didn't understand how genuinely difficult the sport was. I, I don't know if you remember, but I, you, you took your scat to grandpa's house and we had it set up in the garage. <laughs> and, and so I picked up your gun with scat on and now granted, I didn't have a jack or anything, but you know, normally there's like a nice little thing when I'm <laughs> with you and, and mine's going whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't keep it on the eight ring, much less the 10 ring. And, and that, you know, for me, that was the, wow, this is really hard. <laughs> Yeah, but I think that's so important, right? Because that, that starts off a foundation of respect, right? Oh, because yes, it is so important. And I think, you know, the, the athlete has to respect, like, my parents are doing their best, and they're supporting me the best way they know how, and I love them, and they love me. 
And then the parent has to say like, wow, I respect the commitment they're doing. And instead of seeing, you know, they were five minutes late to practice and they forgot their notebook, like, you know, what, how can we see the positives and be there to support them to be a little better with, with the mistakes and the errors, right? So, yeah, I think, um, you know, we're, we're not here to write a book on parenting, but I, I just think <laughs> The Four Pillars of Parenting by Valerie Thrasher. <laughs> But, you know, I, I get questions a lot from, from high schoolers about, you know, they, they struggle to, to communicate, like you said, mom, with their parents. And, and it's hard, right? Let's just recognize that, like, it's a hard dynamic, but it can be a very fulfilling dynamic. And I don't think I would have been halfway near as successful as I am now without the support of my family, you know? Well, and I will say, because, and we can say this now, because all of you kids are in your 20s or 30s, and you're adults, and we have an adult to adult relationship. So, you know, there's hope for the parents and for the kids, because at the end of all this, you, you know, you have a very different relationship. It's more of a pure relationship. Yeah. Uh, and, but you still got to get through the teenage years. <laughs> <laughs> Roddy, 16-year-old Jenny. Yeah, for all the parents listening and struggling in the teenage years, even I was once a huge brat. So there <laughs> is hope, I think. <laughs> I, do a good remember, kid. I do remember the hide your crazy phrase being used. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can remember. I don't know if you remember this, Dad, but um, it must have been my first year of college. And it was like Thanksgiving or Christmas. And I was home for a break. And I slept in and it must have been a Saturday because you were, you know, reading the reading a book in the kitchen and I come out and we're chatting and I, you know, absent mindedly grab for a piece of chocolate. And I can remember you saying, Don't eat chocolate for breakfast. <laughs> and I said, I'm an adult, I do what I want, and I stuff that chocolate in my mouth. <laughs> and you looked at me and you said, You are an adult, actually. <laughs> I, I guess you can have chocolate for breakfast. <laughs> and that that was the moment I think we both kind of realized like, oh, this is now a more peer-to-peer -peer relationship. Yeah, exactly. It's like, I don't know what you're eating at college and you can have chocolate for every meal for all I know. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember that. I thought it was so funny. That's funny. Okay, so I only have one question left for you guys. Um, and I asked this to everyone I have on my lives as the last question. I'm very curious to get your answers because you guys aren't competitive shooters. So what is your favorite thing about shooting? Um, <laughs> you know, so it's funny because, it, so we didn't know, are you talking about when we shoot? Like, cause that's hunting. What's your favorite thing about shooting, Dad? Don't overthink it. Oh. <laughs> so I think my favorite part is the community. The rifle community is a small community. They support each other. They're there for each other. If uh, you win, everybody congratulates me and um, and you. It's kind of funny. And if somebody else wins, I always go and talk to their parents. And I think it's just, we grew as a, when you started at 14, those same kids were in college with you. And we would see people in Colorado at Junior Olympics every year. Even if we didn't see them all year long, we were looking for them. Your, you know, your first roommate actually ended up going to college with you. And those were great experiences. So for me, it's the rifle community. That's a really good point. And I think, you know, for anyone listening, if you guys see my parents at a match, you know, feel free to go talk to them. Cause like yeah. that's, that's how it, it grows and it continues, you know. I'll kind be of outside, continue. I'll be outside. <laughs> yeah, yeah, dad will be at the Starbucks. So if you need him <laughs> and don't talk to mom while I'm shooting. Not while she's shooting. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, did we lose dad? Oh, dad, you there? Uh, well, you said that was the last question, but you, you, you previewed one more. Sorry? Was that your last question? We thought you had one more question for us. Well, we're out of time, unless you, you want to answer that question. Uh, we do. Okay, okay I'm, so I'm gonna... our, our real last question, because 
you know, I sent the, the parents the questions beforehand so they could prepare. So the real last question is, what are your goals for me now? As an adult, as a 24 year old, I'm still gonna be competing for a long time. What are your goals for me? So I have one answer and then mom will answer. My first goal is to get you off our cell phone plan. <laughs> Not happening. <laughs> I am going to be on that family cell phone plan forever. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to the, end the interview with the be happy, follow your dreams, be humble, be kind, get a new truck, basically anything from a country song. Yeah. Mom's over here talking like Tim McGraw. <laughs> <laughs> Always be humble and kind. <laughs> Always. <laughs> and uh, get a new truck. Yeah, that that's from a country song, too. If you yeah. guys don't know, I drive my dad's old truck, and it's, uh, she's limping along a little bit. So <laughs> we'll have to invest in a new one soon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, our time is up. I want to thank you guys so much for coming. Mom and Dad, thank you for coming on and sharing your hard earned wisdom and knowledge with us. Um, I'd also like to thank all of the listeners who made it all the way through for this hour. Um, thank you for the support. Um, I actually had my parents on because I asked you guys who you wanted me to talk to and this was an answer I got a few times. So um, thanks for that. Thanks for facilitating this great conversation. And if you need me, I'm always here. So please let me know if you like this live. My messages are always open and stay tuned because I have lots of awesome Olympic coverage coming. So with that, Thank I will you. say bye, good night, good morning to some people around the world. <laughs> Thank you everyone. Bye. Bye.